Dave Eubank is a heroic American missionary. He joins us to describe how he and his family are persevering in this pandemic. Welcome to another Real American Heroes Coronavirus Special Edition. I'm Oliver North. Our guest today is a dear, dear friend, a former U.S. Army Ranger, a Special Forces officer, a remarkable American, with whom I've kept company in some pretty interesting places. His name is Dave Eubank, and Dave is with us. By the virtues of re remarkable technology, he's in Thailand, and we're here in the United States, and of course, the rest of the world is all shut down from the coronavirus. Dave, give our folks a sense for what you've seen right there in Thailand and all the other places you've been, because this actually began last year when you were overseas in a different place, Syria. Yes, sir. First, may God bless you, sir, and your Amen. audience in Jesus' name. Amen. And buddy. I'm glad we can connect with you and with anyone who's watching this. We just came out of Syria, and when we were in this last Syria mission, the virus was starting in China. It didn't, we didn't think about it in Syria because people are dying. My, one of my best friends and cameramen was killed right next to me during the Turkish invasion earlier. And so we had ISIS still going. We had the Turks, we had the Free Syrian Army, you had the Russians, you have Assad, you had this big thing. But when I came back to Thailand in March, you could see the virus was building momentum. But our other area of work, which is our main area for the Free Burma Rangers is in Burma and the fighting has not stopped. Whether or not the virus is there very much, no one really knows because there's only testing in one city. But the people in the mountains like the Karen, the Kachen, the Shan, these tribal people, they're under attack almost every day. So actually the virus is the last thing they're worried about. Right now I've got teams responding to daily mortar attacks against villagers in Northern Karen state and we're planning to go up there ourselves in May and follow up. So in all out war areas, they're not that worried about the virus. They're fighting for their lives. And in our situation, our family, I don't know how to say this, but one blessing that's happened through this whole thing for us is that I was supposed to be in America seeing y'all right now, but because the virus shut down the planes, I'm with my mom and dad. My dad's 90, my mom's 88. And they've been missionaries here for 60 years. Before we came down from the north to the south, I said, Dad, you sure you and Mom want us to come? You know, we're coming from our big team up there. What if we bring the virus and get you sick? And my dad says, Dave, something's going to get you. And if it's one thing, <laughs> something else. And he said, besides, we're not immortal. And I knew who I, I belonged to. That's Jesus. And I can think of no better way to die than to see my kids and grandkids. So come on down. So Dave, let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges of travel. You came back from Syria in March. It was already worldwide at that point. Did you have any trouble getting flights back to Thailand? No, I didn't. We got, we got back, but many of our teams have had trouble flying back to America right now. So I've got a family and six single people, volunteers staying at my house because they couldn't get out of the country. They're stuck. Now, it's not a bad place to be stuck. We've got horses, monkeys, basketball. We have a lot of, it's like a, a little ranch. But they are stuck and they can't fly out. And it's important to everybody, but especially two of the families, the, the fathers are commercial pilots and they fly in the bush in Alaska, but they can't get back there to fly. They don't have a job. So that's impacted them, but we're trusting God that he's gonna take care of them. So one of the things that we're hearing back here in the States is that places where malaria is present, and Burma is one of those places, the sub-Saharan Africa area where you've been in Sudan, for example, where people have been taking as a prophylaxis various kinds of medications, it appears that that, in some cases at least, keeps people from getting ill from coronavirus. Are your kids taking anti-malarial medications? Well, whenever we go in the jungle, they do. We, they take doxycycline or they take chloroquine or methylquine. But right now here in Thailand, and we'll, when we go into Burma on a mission, um, hopefully in a couple of weeks, we'll all take that. But right now in Thailand, we're not taking anything. Although I have with me a jar of chloroquine right now, which hasn't been 100% proven to be effective, but it's the best thing that we know about. And 
the chief of our medical work in Burma is an American physician, was a Navy doctor. He's up in Washington State now, and, and I trust him with everything. He said, that's the best, that's the best we know of right now. So we have, we sent in four backpacks full of more chloroquine to our frontline clinics and, but they don't have enough to live on it, but they, it's going to be the frontline treatment. Although we don't know of any coronavirus yet in the mountains where the fighting is. So how about in the cities of Thailand? In Thailand, there's a curfew from um, 10 o'clock at night until four in the morning. And a lot of the big businesses and malls are shut. All the restaurants are shut. You can deliver, but you can go to the grocery store and it's not that strict, but business is suffering. And I, the sickness is almost 3000 cases, but less than 50 dead. I think it's 47 dead of the virus. In, in all of Thailand. Whole country. In all of Thailand. So it's not at all as big a problem as it is in the States. If you adjust it for population, it's probably seven times less of a problem or 10 times less. And you guys haven't run out of toilet paper either. <laughs> That's the last thing we're going to buy. <laughs> <laughs> for the life of me, There's I can't figure out water. You got <laughs> water, you got leaves. <laughs> yeah. For the life of me, I can't figure out why there was this urgent hoarding of toilet paper all over America. It's back in stock now. Sir, that means we're still winning. That means yeah. we're still the most powerful country in the world. It's a good sign. Well, I'm looking for You've got your book coming out this summer. I'm looking forward to seeing you back here. You and I were supposed to be get together at the National Press Club today or tomorrow, and we were supposed to be doing interviews about your book. Give us a quick readout on the book. Well, the, the book, first, thanks, sir. You're a real writer. I'm not. And thanks for helping me. You know, I, I remember meeting in um, Kurdistan when you were with the Peshmerga helping them, and then you were with us in the front line. And unlike all, almost everybody else, you slept with us on the front line. And I remember your, your detail there with the, the huge um, South African Eric pulling security up there. Amazing. We love you. And you led us in devotions. That was good for our hearts. So it was on my heart to write this book, and it's called Do This for Love, Free Burma Rangers in the Battle of Mosul. And there's a little bit about Burma in there because that's our main work and where we've been the last 20 years and where we still are. But the most of the book is focused on the Battle of Mosul. Starts off on Sinjar Mountain with the, with the Kurds and the Yazidis, and then it works into the battle itself, where I learned to love the Iraqis. You know, I didn't love them. I didn't even know them. I learned to love them. And I learned about the difference between justice and revenge, and the difference is love. And I saw the bravery of the American generals who dropped smoke to help save lives. You know, for me, as a civilian, they took huge risks. Um, professionally to save lives. And it was God, our team, Americans, the Iraqis, the Kurds, Yazidis working together. So the book should be done in July. And I'm not sure exactly when it'll be published, but pretty much if you tell me to come back, I'll salute and come back if there's something to come back to. But as soon as we know when it's gonna be published, but it'll come out this year, yeah then I'd love to be on anything with you to talk about it. You will be, buddy. You can pre-order it now. Pre-order it at Amazon. On Amazon now. Right. Absolutely right. Do this right. for love, Freedom Rangers, and the Battle of Mosul. Last question. You and I have known each other through thick and thin. 50 years from now, when your great-grandkids are studying about this extraordinary time in history, what do you want them to know about what you and your family did? Number one, God is bigger than the virus. Number two, we don't want people to die. And so we'll do our best to save them. Number three, live our life the best we can. And God has an answer for each person what they should do, whether it's about the virus or anything. We don't all get the same orders, but there's a harmony in the way God has us doing different things, but in harmony together. And so no God is bigger. Keep praising him. Try to save people. Keep your freedom. Ask God what you should do. Don't tell other people what they should do. Ask God what you should do and then work together. Dave, my sincere thanks for being with us today, providing facts our Americans can use in these challenging times. We're going to continue documenting the history of this never before crisis with these special coronavirus episodes. 
If this Real American Heroes special broadcast has been informative, helpful, or encouraging, take time now to subscribe and let me know how these unprecedented events have affected you and yours. By doing so, you too may become part of this historical record of how America persevered and once again prospered. Until next time, remember, Semper Fidelis is more than a slogan for U.S. Marines. Always faithful is a way of life. Now, America, press on, press on.